Ladies and gentlemen, a year ago, a man sets himself in, on fire in Tunisia, and the reverberations are felt throughout the entire Middle East. There were such excited anticipations. The famous historian Olivia Roy speaks about a post-Western Middle East. Many others, I'm sure your colleagues, Michael, spoke about the fact that finally democratization had reached the Middle East, that they were going to have some kind of Madisonian revolution, and that the Islamists had been sidelined. This was the fad of the moment. Now, Michael's stories, they're personalized stories. They may warm the cockles of your heart. I'm human, and of course that which is personalized moves me. However, here we're talking about strategy and national security. And on an, on an individual and civilizational level, there's a danger of projection, where we transpose our values and, ans and aspirations onto the other. In this case, the Arab world. Those against the motion contend that history is always linear. Uprisings would lead to revolutions. Revolutions would replace the old guard with its repressive security apparatus. A new guard would be focused on achieving technocratic reform. This new guard would promote liberalism and modernity. Ultimately, this new guard's orientation would be pro-Western. Yet revolutions can be hijacked, and history is not linear. The Mensheviks never thought that the Bolsheviks would hijack the next phase of the Russian Revolution. Those that cried out liberty and fraternity when storming the Bastille never thought that this historical momentum would culminate in the guillotine. A year ago, Islamists simply waited on the sidelines to reap the dividends that others sowed. Bin Laden himself expressed it was necessary to, quote, remain cautious and awake because all the gains it has achieved in this popular revolution are now and in the future exposed to thievery, robbery, and manipulation. The gains he referred to was the downfall of secular autocrats that enjoyed the support of the West in return for an artificial security that it guaranteed. In Egypt, the Muslim Brotherhood and the Salafists together have won over 70% of the vote. Islamists have won prominence in Libya. They've enjoyed victories in Tunisia. And the Muslim Brotherhood now stands to gain from the fall of the Assad regime. The Islamists are not moderate. And to say otherwise would be a tantamount as to what the West did to project, as they did in 1979, with the Iranian Revolution. Khomeini was touted as a moderate, as an anti-imperialist, as a capitalist, and yes, even as a supporter of feminism. The US ambassador to Iran, William Sullivan, wrote that Khomeini would work well with younger officers in the Shah's army. There's Richard Falk, who's today at the UN, the, the quintessential tree hugger, who, at the time, published an article in the New York Times entitled, Trusting Khomeini. And it was argued that he was surrounded by prominent, moderate politicians who had, quote, a notable record of concern for human rights. My support of this resolution is in line with my critique of the West's approach towards the Middle East. This approach has been very, very artificial and top-down, simply demanding elections and not supporting the forces of liberalization, as this was too financially draining and time-consuming. Time and time again, the Bush administration had to embarrassingly retreat after it had demanded elections in Egypt, and the Muslim Brotherhood gained greater numbers of seats in the parliament. In Gaza in 2006, Hamas came to power. In Iraq, People with elections voted on ethnic lines, leading to greater bloodshed and political deadlock. The West's failed approach towards the Middle East was facilitated with its obsession of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. There were those that promoted, like the failed former National Security Advisor, General Jim Jones, that the road to Tehran runs through Jerusalem. A year ago in a conference, I thought that he was smoking weed when he said, if God appeared to me in a room, 
and asked, which one conflict in the whole world would you ask to be addressed that would resolve all global issues? He responded to God, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Our own Tony Blair echoed King Hussein, who said that resolving the Israeli-Palestinian conflict was a central pressure point in which, once addressed, would dissipate all regional tensions. Ultimately, we don't want democracy today in the Middle East, but we do want liberalism to take root that will culminate in liberal democracy. Liberalism is marked by the separation of powers, the rule of law, property rights, the freedom of assembly, the freedom of speech, and the freedom of religion. These freedoms protect an individual's liberties from coercion. Fareed Zakari has expressed, constitutional liberalism is not the pr about the procedures for selecting a government, but rather the government's goals. Where there has been democracy in the past without liberal foundations, the Nazi party was able to rise to power in Germany. Hamas and Hezbollah were able to assume power in Gaza and Lebanon, respectively, and the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. Their set of goals are very different to liberal ones, but rather are marked by despotism, the establishment of Sharia law, and ultimately even genocide. Indeed, the absence of liberalism has caused the Coptic Christians in Egypt to flee, as they will not find comfort in the electoral mandate of the ballot box, and, but they will be persecuted in the absence of liberalism. The tectotic plates move unpredictably, Democracy and liberali without liberalization simply widens the vacuum of governance where nationalist tensions collide, such as between Turkey and Iran over Syria. At other times, a rapprochement can be achieved, as Iran and Egypt experience with, for the first time in over 30 years, Iran sending warships through the Suez Canal. Nuclear materials can proliferate, terrorism can mutate, and radicalism is bred. Iran has sought to extend its sphere of influence in Afghanistan and Iraq to foster political deadlock. There, as well as smuggling weapons, just under a week ago, the commander of Iran's Revolutionary Guards Quds Force was in Damascus to help Assad suppress the growing uprising. Similarly, Al-Qaeda is in the process of reconstituting itself in Yemen and Somalia. Rocket launchers from Libya have found their way to Gaza, and Libyan fighters on the side of Gaddafi are now engaged in Mali. The likelihood is high that Syria's biological and chemical weapons will be a free-for-all for terrorist networks around the world to enjoy with their smuggling spree. The same threat emerged with the collapse of the Soviet Union, as the black market was filled with conventional and unconventional weapons. The Islamist embrace of liberalism does not seem to be taking place, as Islamists value identity and resistance rather than growth. We don't see any of the Islamists advancing technocratic reform. Time and time again, Egypt has snubbed the US as well as multilateral offers of aid in order to kickstart its economy. A new poll pu published by Gallup re revealed that some 70% of Egyptians surve surveyed oppose the United States economic aid to Egypt. When their economies and their societies stagnate and they don't embrace reform, what do we expect? Do we expect for them to speak the language of technocratic reform? No. They will once again focus on the great Satan of the United States and the little Satan that is Israel. In order for our security to merge with our ideals and aspirations, I urge to you today to vote in favor of this motion that we exhort our policymakers to toil so that in our days we can see the advent of liberalization thrive in the Middle East. We can pray that afterwards, in the days of our grandchildren or our great-grandchildren, liberal democracy will finally take root in the Middle East. Thank you.